We've just read at the end of, of that passage that in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. This is, um, we just read the Olivet Prophecy, and, and it's a passage that is carried in a number of, um, how would we put it, parallel passages in a slightly, slightly different context, but it's there for us. So um, we can see that this is carried in Matthew chapter 24 as well, Mark chapter 13 and Luke chapter 21, which we've looked at. My intention this evening is to look at the context of the words that we read in verse 26. Um, men's hearts failing them for fear. What does that mean? What's the scriptural context and what does that mean to us today? Has it got any relevance? Now, um, I'm going to start not by asking you to turn to Luke chapter 21. Let's have a look at Matthew chapter 24 and the third verse, please. Um, we read there... And again, you, you, you get the, the context of the Mount of Olives and the Olivet Prophecy. Verse 3 of Matthew chapter 24. As Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying. So what did they come and ask Jesus? Quite a specific couple of questions. Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So, when shall these things be? That refers to what Jesus has um, talked about and shown in verses 1 and 2 of the chapter. Jesus goes out from the temple. His disciples come to him to show him the buildings of the temple. Uh, and Jesus says to them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now that passage can have a dual implication. It can be a literal uh, destruction of the temple and it can also be a spiritual destruction of the temple the disciples are inquiring when will this be and then they tag on a second question and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and there's a parallel there the sign of your coming well Jesus is already there so that indicates that there's going to be another coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and the disciples are assuming that that will bring the end of the world, or the end of the age, as, as it's recorded in other more modern versions. Not that that is particularly important. So, when we read this passage, and you can see it plays out in Matthew chapter 24, but we're going to turn our attention now to Luke chapter 21, we're going to just look at what Jesus says as a response to that question. Or couple of questions so again you can see in Luke chapter 21 verses 5 and 6 that Jesus spoke of the temple so you've got the, the context there and about the destruction of the temple in verse 6 and you've got the question then in verse 7 when shall these things be and what sign will there be when these things come to pass now I'm going to look at the chapter in a number of ways we're going to look at a passage which runs from verses 7 to 19. Then we're going to look at a passage that runs from verse 20 through 24. And then we're going to look at a section, verses 25 to 28, after which we will sweep. Okay, and hopefully bring things together and make it meaningful and logical. So, when we start off, we're going to start by looking at verses 7 to 19. And we're, we're, we're thinking about what shall this be, the questions that are posed. Well, first and foremost, Jesus says, take heed or beware in verse 8. And what are they to take heed of and beware of? Deception. There are going to be many who come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to present themselves as the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, don't listen to them. They, they, they aren't the real thing. Be aware. So the first point is that there will be false messiahs. People who say, I'm Christ, listen to me. And then there's a little passage which looks at verses 9 to 11 within this context of 7 to 19. And really, this, these verses describe social collapse. Verse 9, when shall you hear of wars and commotions? Well, you should not be terrified. These things must first come to pass, but the end isn't yet, or, or not by and by. So there's, there's going to be, let's say, warfare and conflict. 
Verse 10, then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Well, that, that reiterates the same point. He's, sometimes mankind can be a bit dumb. I certainly know that Zoe tells me that she has to tell me the same thing three times for it to penetrate. And, and, and Jesus is taking the same approach here with the disciples. So there, there's going to be conflict, be aware. And then he adds a bit in verse 11. Earthquakes in many places, famines, diseases, pestilences, and then fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. So this conflict, these signs that you see, these events, these global occurrences, are divine. They, they are done by God to give you a sign of what is occurring. So then we have the following verses in verse 12 to 17, which essentially focus on the believer. Because before all this, then what will happen? They, others, unbelievers, not the disciples, shall lay their hands on you and persecute you. They'll deliver you up, in, in the language of the day, to the synagogues, to the, the, the elite, the rulers, to prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for your belief, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. So there's an opportunity there to, to preach, to tell people that this is the way that the Lord God has planned it. And then there's an instruction. Settle it therefore in your hearts. Don't, you don't need to worry or meditate what you're going to say because if you are following a godly lifestyle and you put your faith in the Lord God, well, he will provide the words and, and, and the responses you need in that difficult situation. But be aware, verse 16, irrespective of family and friends, you, you are going to be betrayed uh, and betrayal can lead to death. So th the picture of persecution continues. Summed up nicely in verse 17, you're going to be hated of all men for my name's sake. So specifically for your belief, there is going to be condemnation and that condemnation could result in, in, in death. But, so we've got a beware, now we've got a but. So, so all of this is terrible, but there shall not a hair of your head perish in your patience possessing your souls. And just for a, a simpler understanding of verse 19, the ESV says, by your endurance, your patience, you will gain your lives. Now we're going to cut, come on a couple of words. Brother Mike mentioned it in his prayer, he talked about redemption. So here, we, we're looking at how you can gain your lives, how the promise of life is carried in the scriptures and here specifically in the words of the Lord Jesus Christ to his closest of the disciples. So if you continue to maintain your faith in God, then God will provide. But you have to endure, you have to be patient, but there is the promise of life that comes through the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, in summary, we can see that there's a general response of the Lord Jesus Christ to the query. He hasn't answered, when will this be? He's given some indications. And he's saying, there are going to be people who misrepresent me and come in my name, don't trust them. The world order will be changed and will be very difficult. And particularly, there will be persecution of believers. But, nota bene, salvation is promised to those who are faithful and enduring in their faith. So, what we're going to do now is say, well, that was the, that was the general response of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's said next? Now, verses 20 to 24, the, the next passage that I'm going to look at, is specifically in reference to the destruction of the temple. The temple was a building that was at the centre of Jerusalem and certainly at the centre of Jewish life and Jerusalem life. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, Jesus says, well then you will know that its desolation, its destruction is nigh. And then there are some key pointers. Uh, let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, 
let them which are in the midst of it depart, let not them that are in the countries enter thereinto. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And then there's some, some instruction. Woe to those who are with child, pregnant, uh, that give suck in those days. There shall be great distress and wrath and anger. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword. They shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So now we've got, we've got some pointers here. You'll know that the destruction of Jerusalem is coming when it's surrounded by armies. Well, there's a self-evident response. But there, there are some keys there. You will do well to get yourself out of Jerusalem because the destruction is going to be so great that even the residents of, or the remaining residents of Jerusalem are going to be taken away captive. They will be trodden down. The city will be trodden down. Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles. And this will continue until such a time as the days of the Gentiles, the rest of the world, the non-Israelites, are fulfilled or accomplished. So, in, in a time of need, you go to Wikipedia, don't you? <laughs> so, so, there are some words. And, and Wikipedia gives you a good summary. I, I wouldn't say you would always rely on it. Rebecca certainly doesn't look like she would always rely on it. <laughs> but the key point is it gives us a guide. And, and, and this is factually correct. The siege of Jerusalem in the year 70, so not very long after the words of the Lord Jesus Christ are stated, in the year 70 was the decisive event of the first Jewish-Roman war. The Roman army led by the future emperor Titus with Tiberius Julius Alexander as his second in command besieged and conquered the city of Jerusalem, which had been occupied by the Jewish defenders since AD 66. The siege ends with the sacking of the city. So what did, what did Jesus say? The city would be trodden down. Here we're being told that the, sea, the city was sacked and the destruction of its second temple, the Herodian temple. The destruction of both the first and second temples is still mourned annually as part of a Jewish feast, Tishbav. The arch of Titus, which still stands in Rome, is a memorial of that historic event. So go look and you have evidence that this is what occurred. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy and chapter 18, just, just as a, a little sort of um, support for our understanding of these words. And um, I'm just going to look at verse 22, actually. When a prophet... That's Deuteronomy 18 and verse 22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hasn't spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. So the verses really from verse 18 through to 22 carry what we could loosely describe as the prophet's test. If somebody purports to be a prophet of the Lord God, and if the words that he speaks come to pass, well, then you can trust him. If the words don't come to pass, well, he's a fraud and a charlatan. <laughs> Have nothing to do with him. He is a ne'er-do-well, or, in the context of Luke 21, he's a false messiah, a false Christ. He's coming in the name of Christ, but he isn't the Christ. So, how does that give us an understanding of the words that we've just looked at in Luke 21. Well, if Jesus was talking rubbish, that wouldn't have happened. You wouldn't have that Wikipedia entry. You wouldn't have that arch of Titus that still stands in Rome. So, the words that Jesus spoke were fulfilled in AD 70. And... As a consequence of that, we can take some heart from the words that follow in the remainder of the chapter. So, Jesus has specifically answered one of the questions that the disciples have asked. This now leads us to the, the next session, which looks at... Um, I'm going to just hold on to that one. We're going to look at the passage from verses 25 to 28. Okay. Now, this is where we, we get a little bit more... Um, detailed there's some figurative language and, and we see 
that Jesus introduces this by saying there will be signs. Uh, and that's what the disciples have asked for, verse 7. When shall these things be? What will be the signs of these things coming to pass? So now, now we're getting to the nitty gritty of the Lord Jesus' response. There are going to be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, on the earth, distress of nations. There will be perplexity and the sea and the waves will roar. Okay. Um, we then read the words that are, are, are the subject of the title. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. So there's a reason for people's concern, anxiety. They are uncertain and they are anxious about what is occurring in the world around them. Why? Because the powers of heaven are shaken. And when these things begin, um, then, sorry, I'm jumping myself, verse 27, then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, Look up, lift up your heads, your redemption draws nigh. So, what do we see there? And, and, and this is the, the little bit that I'm putting there. The Lord Jesus Christ says that first and foremost, there are going to be signs in the sun, moon and stars. Nations will be distressed and perplexed. Sea and waves will roar. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. Powers of heaven shall be shaken. And... Most importantly, for a believer, for the disciples who were hearing the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus is going to return. It's going to quite specific there, in a cloud with power and great glory. And there's this promise. We've already been told that those who endure will gain their lives. Now they're being promised that their redemption draws nigh. And the redemption that the Israelites and the disciples specifically would understand takes them right back to the Mosaic law and, and, and the idea of Passover and redemption from bondage in, in Egypt is relevant. The idea of atonement where sin, the disobedience in, in front of the commands of the Lord God are forgiven. They were redeemed through that Mosaic law and that is what that would mean to them. So there's a biblical uh, subject which is secondary to the talk tonight but which is really important because the Israelites and the disciples specifically would have been very very keen to know about redemption and when that would occur so with that said what do we understand so first and foremost we're going to look at um, this little bit here we I put one two three four and five up before so we're going to look at one and three the signs in the sun, moon and stars, and we're going to see the sea and the waves roaring. What does that mean for us? Well, very early in the scriptures, in Genesis in chapter 37, there's, there's an episode recorded with a young man called Joseph. Now, Joseph um, had, had a number of brothers, a good number of brothers, more than we would normally have today, and, and he had a, a father called Jacob. And in verse 9 of Genesis and chapter 37, we hear that Joseph dreamed yet another dream. And he can't contain himself and he tells his brothers. And he says, look, or well, behold, I've dreamed a dream, another dream, a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance or bowed down to me. He tells his father and to his brethren, and his father tells him off. His father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee on the earth? His brethren envied him, and they were jealous, and his father watches him. Now, what does that tell us? It doesn't tell us much. It talks about the sun, the moon, and the stars. But there's a direct reference to Jacob who is one of the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, Jacob's wife and Jacob's children, the brothers of Joseph. And they are going to bow down to Joseph. Jacob understood that and tells him off. That's not the normal order of things. Certainly not that your father and mother would come to bow down to you. So here the language of the sun, the moon and the stars is in direct relation to the nation of Israel. 
Now I want you to turn to the prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 31. And we, we see similar language here. Jeremiah 31 is a really important chapter in the prophecy of, of Jeremiah because it talks about a new promise, or, or in Old Testament language, a new covenant. And um, that is introduced in verse uh, 27. Uh, Behold, the days come of, of Jeremiah 31, verse 27. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will sow the house of Israel, the house of Judah, with the seed of man, with the seed of beast. And it shall come to pass that, like as I've watched over them, to pluck up, to break down, to throw down, to destroy, to afflict, so will I watch over them to build and to plant new life, saith the Lord. In those days, they'll say no more, the fathers have eaten a sour grape and children's teeth are set on edge. Everyone shall die for his own iniquity. So you're responsible for your own actions. Everyone that eats a sour grape, well, his teeth will be on edge. So whatever you do, you, you take the consequences. And then verse 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant. And this is specifically with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, the nation of Israel. <coughs> collectively so this isn't to be a, a covenant that is according to the covenant that was made with the fathers with Moses um, when they came out of the land of Egypt but verse 33 this will be the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel it will be in their inward parts in their hearts it says in verse 33 and he will be their God and, and, and the Israelites will be their people now what do we read verse 35 <coughs> Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divides the sea when the waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If these ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord, well then the seed of Israel shall cease from being a nation before me forever. So why have I gone there? Well, there's a promise of a new covenant which will bring life, and that promise is tied up in language which talks about the very descriptions that we see in Luke chapter 21. The sun, the moon, the stars, the waves roaring. And that is in direct reference to the nation of Israel. So we've seen a very obvious reference in Genesis with the promise, uh, uh, the, the, the vision that Joseph had. And then we see it again in Jeremiah. And if we were doing more, we'd have a look at Isaiah 51 as well. So, if we are approaching the end days, the days when we would expect to see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory, to go back to Luke chapter 21, well then we would expect to see things happening in the nation of Israel. Now, I've put a couple of things up here. Um, simple words again. Um, it's quite easy to go to Donald Trump for a rent quote, but I'm, I'm afraid Donald Trump occupies a very important position in global power and politics. And there are just two things there. He shocked the world when he said he was going to move the US Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is a disputed city that is, is fractured east and west. And then, more recently, Donald Trump has dropped a 20-year-old US commitment to pursue a, a dual state solution to the problem that is presented in the Middle East. So again, we can see Israel very simply with just two very uh, erstwhile quotes from the Guardian, uh, and they tell us that things are happening with the nation of Israel. There is much more happening with the nation of Israel, and I could talk about that at great length. A lot of that which relates to anti-Semitism that is rising within Europe, also in America, but also uh, the words that come out of Iran in relation to their relationship with Israel, and so on and so forth. Now, Israel is always in the news, but with the leader of the United States, as it were, ripping up previous text and, and political solution, and promoting a different solution, well, the nation is very much um, concerned, and the region is concerned, and so are the, the remaining powers that sit within the world at this moment in time. So, if we look at Luke chapter 21 and we see signs, 
Well, that's an indication that the return, the coming of the Son of Man, is close. But also, we read about distress of nations with perplexity. Um, I, I've forgotten which number that was in my list. I could possibly improve by putting that on there. But I'm just going to put this up here now. Um, so we're talking about distress of nations and concern and perplexity and anxiety. There's a sequence of names there and then some events. We've got Donald Trump. Well, he's enough to scare, <laughs> scare the pants off you. You've got Vladimir Putin. Well, he postures and has his summer holiday photos taken whilst he continues to, to, to um, try to re-establish the power of, of Russia within what was the previous Soviet space. You've got Bashar al-Assad, and again, the relationship there with Vladimir Putin and the US interest in Syria. You've got this, um, this madman, Kim Jong-un. He may not be so very mad, he's clinging to power in his own provincial place. But again, the developments that he's having there with nuclear power, uh, ballistic missiles, is sufficient to cause concern across China, Japan, all the way across to the US again. And then you've got political upheaval with Brexit. You've got the European nationalism and anti-Semitism that I've mentioned. You've got this, as it were, chaotic uh, representation of Islam through ISIS. And, and Mike mentioned the events that occurred in Barcelona. I think, Donald, you said that there had been five similar terrorist attacks within the last week. So, really and truly, the world is not a safe place. And then you can add in lots of minor conflicts in places like Yemen, Sudan, Nigeria, uh, and you can see the, the unsettling political climate that we currently inhabit. And then there are global changes, climate change, which is a huge concern. And again, you see the US throwing things in the bin and doing things in their own way. So where, where there was almost pan-global agreement, you now have a fractured treaty which is very worth, well, not worth very much at all. So if we're going to talk about distress of nations, I certainly think that we can, we can say that we're in that place. Now, in verse 26 we have this phrase, men's hearts failing them for fear. Um, so We could look and say, well, what's the state of the world and think about cardiac disease and all that sort of thing. And I, I really don't present that as a serious understanding of that verse. Um, 17 and a half million people apparently in 2012, according to the WHO, died with heart-related diseases. And that, that is increasing. Uh, and you could say in some way that is people fainting with fear. Um, the ES ESV says people fainting with fear as opposed to hearts failing them with fear. Um, so you've got fear and foreboding. If you look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30, it talks about mourning and, and people's uh, grief with the situation that is sitting there today. I've posed an, italics, an italicized question at the base of that slide. Is it fair to say that we can see this attitude emerging in today's society? I think the only logical conclusion is that that is the answer. Um, uh, I've got, um, forgive me, I'm not looking at the baseball scores or anything like that on, on my phone. I've got a quote here which comes from the much um, uh, attacked CNN, uh, which is the American news portal, or one of them. And, and it wrote following the rather bizarre events in America uh, and racism and, and, and all the issues that that raises, that there was political comment, and I thought this was quite important to understand. They wrote that Trump's behaviour last week, which they call politically self-destructive, they say it was a display that will renew questions about the suitability of Trump's temperament for the presidency at a time of increasing tensions around the world that will exacerbate fears that he will be unable to control his emotions at a time of crisis as commander-in-chief. So it's not so much his concern about his position as the president, but as the president of the US, he's also the autocratic chief of the US armed forces. And if he gives an instruction to the, the head of the army and, and, and the armed services in America, they have to act. A and people will act if orders are not followed. So the point that the uh, CNN 
uh, opinion writer is making there is that there is a lot of doubt about Trump's temperament at a time when there is increasing global tension and exacerbated fears about how the US could act. And as they are purportedly one of the greatest global powers today, well then, I think when I say, is it fair to say that we can see the concern with people fainting with fear and foreboding, that it is very much the case. So, if that is the case, well, we can see that we should be looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told how he will come in verse 27. They shall see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So, again, we can um, go to an Old Testament passage. You don't need to turn to it. I've got a bookmark there, but if you want to, you can. Daniel chapter 7 and verses 13 and 14. So this is the prophet Daniel, and what does he say? He says, I saw in the night visions. Behold, one, like the Son of Man, came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that will which that which shall not be destroyed so again you've got the repetition just to make sure we get the message the kingdom that the, the lord jesus christ the son of man will bring when he returns is going to be global it will be glorious all nations and people will be serving him and it will be everlasting it won't pass away and it will not be destroyed. So there's the repetition. Get it. It's going to be a new world order and it is going to be a new world order according to the laws of God. And it is going to be heralded with the same language, the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. So the Bible's message is consistent. We could turn up other passages, but for the purpose of this evening, that is sufficient. If we were to look at Acts chapter 1, we see that again. As the Lord Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, the disciples say, well, when, when, when shall he come back? And, and, and the, 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 the angels who are there say, he's going to return in exactly the same way as you have seen him go. He will return, and he will return into, with the clouds that we've just read. So the return of Jesus that will bring the end of the age that we read about within the disciples question will be heralded by the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishing of this kingdom on earth and that will naturally relate to the gaining your lives if you endure in your faith and it will also relate to redemption the forgiveness of sins and the promise that we read in Jeremiah chapter 31 so where do we go now? Let's have a look at verse 31. I said I would sweep at the end and I've probably gone on far too long. Um, we're going to, to just look at this, this idea. Verse 31, or, or verse 29 and 30 for connection. Behold, it, you look at the fig tree and, and when you see the fig tree putting forth new leaves, well, then you say well, it's summertime. <laughs> it's not a hard deduction. Certainly, um, I, I know that when I look at my red currants and, and you see the, the, the leaves coming and, and, and the berries forming, I'm, I'm looking forward to not just the, the summer coming, but the cricket season coming as well. So we look at nature and, and we take our guide from that. But here, verse 30, when they shoot forth, you see, and you know of your own self, summer is at hand. In exactly the same way, verse 31, when you see these things, the perplexity, the fear, the anxiety, the, 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 the science in Israel, well, then you can know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. So now we're not talking about the return of Christ, we're talking about that which follows, the kingdom of God. And, and um, that is an important word for us. But verse 34, all of this, we, 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 have, we have the uh, but in verse 18, but if you endure, you will be preserved, you will be saved. Now we have a, a beware, 
take heed to yourselves. So look at what you are doing. This isn't about us, this is about each of us individually. Lest at any time your hearts are overcharged with surfeiting, drunkenness, cares of this life, so that day, the day of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. So the whole earth is going to be surprised. And then the instruction, verse 36, is Watch ye therefore and pray always, not just once, but pray continually that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. So if we see the events that Jesus has talked about in Luke 21 occurring, and we can take heart from the accuracy of those words with the fulfilment of the prophecy in AD 70. We can see the signs and the political movements that are occurring in the world today. Well, that shouldn't concern us like it concerns the rest of the world. Because we know that there is a promise that God has made to mankind. But what we should do is be aware that if we are not ready, then there is a problem. If we are concerned with the world and the lives that we lead, then there is a problem. Watch therefore and pray. Talk to the Lord your God and you will learn. So I've got two references I want to take you to now. Again, the first one um, you'll probably be familiar with, so you don't need to turn to it. Um, I'll put it there on the screen. 2 Peter and chapter 3. And, and we see there that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but the Lord is long-suffering to us, would, not willing that anyone should perish. So God doesn't want anyone to fail. He will keep his promise. He wants all to come to repentance. And then you've got the warning. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in shall be burned up. And we get the instruction to be ready. And then the other reference which I've used, and I've put it there almost in its full context. One of the last messages that the Lord Jesus Christ left with the disciples, first and foremost in verse 15, he told them to go out into all the world and preach. It's an obligation of all believers but then he said whoever responds to that preaching whoever believes and is baptized will be saved so belief on its own isn't good enough belief and action is required whoever doesn't believe is going to be condemned so that is the entirety of my talk and I leave it quite bluntly on that note because we can see tremendous things happening in the world today words and actions that are mirrored in the gospel many many years ago we have faith and hope in those words because they have been fulfilled and proven true before and we have the promise of a wonderful time to come but we have to look at ourselves and see how we are responding to the requirements of the Lord God and his son the Lord Jesus Christ